so it's been almost five years since I've been in SMH. So that means I'm about uh, half the age of Dr. Etiraldi. Um, <laughs> but I was an infant prodigy, so uh, I was in training in Boston five years ahead of him. Um, but surgeons always beat you. So Dr. Sell came about a month after me. So they always, I don't know how, surgeons always have this uh, access to everything, including the fountain of youth. So, but anyway, uh, without beating around the bush, we'll go around with atrial fibrillation. Uh, as a cardiac electrophysiologist, it is a bane of my existence. It's a frustrating rhythm problem. Uh, it frustrates the patients and the physicians and all around them. But unfortunately, we have to deal with that. Um, but uh, 15 years ago, when I started doing ablations for this arrhythmia, uh, my partner in Indianapolis said, uh, he was my senior partner, and he was trained in uh, Indiana University, which is a cradle of electrophysiology, and he didn't be uh, believe in uh, ablation for atrial fibrillation. And most cardiologists, and I'm sure most cardiac surgeons probably don't believe in it, and I have to keep my faith, because uh, he said that uh, it, you cannot beat atrial fibrillation, it's like death. So, and, and partly he's right, it is a chronic disease, but on the other hand, we have to confront it, and uh, it is a disease with a significant morbidity and mortality as well. So, atrial fibrillation, all of us will encounter uh, throughout the, any cardiologist, cardiac surgeon will encounter it. Because it's the most common cardiac arrhythmia, uh, there's about 5 million um, AFib patients currently, and that number is going to double by 2050. And why is atrial fibrillation more than the symptoms? What we are all concerned is the risk of stroke. With atrial fibrillation, they have a higher stroke risk for older patients than those with prior stroke or TIA. Almost 20% of all strokes, all comers of strokes, are related to atrial fibrillation, and it results in a greater disability compared to a non-AFib-related stroke. So it is a disease, not a benign disease, and, um, and the main problem with atrial fibrillation is the risk for stroke. So what's the solution? So anticoagulants have been there for a long time, and there was always debate whether they need to be on Coumadin or aspirin. And eventually, we came up with a scoring system uh, because all the anticoagulation is not benign either. So where do you have the, assess the risk versus uh, benefit ratio? And we find that using the score system, if you have a chats vasc or now we have a chats vasc two score, if it is more than two, then the annual stroke risk is about two to 15 percent. So we believe that anticoagulants are recommended in them. So uh, going back to the, what the CHATS2 VAS score is, uh, so C stands for congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, age, uh, if it's more than 65, you get a one point. If it's more than 75, you get two points. Uh, stroke, you get two points. And uh, in the vascular part is we have peripheral vascular disease, or if you have aortic plaques, or if you have a prior MI, that's considered vascular disease. And um, if women are at higher risk, so if you are a, a female, you get one point extra, like everything else. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, but chats vas score of zero does not mean your stroke risk is zero. That's the wrong message to take. Because even when you have a, a score of one, uh, anticoagulants may be considered. So most often, uh, patients come to me after an ablation. They say they, they like to, they're actually not that concerned about the symptoms. They want to go off the Coumadin. They say, come to me, can you, can you go off the Coumadin? I usually actually don't volunteer to get them off the anticoagulant. If they've been tolerating anticoagulants all along, my inclination is probably not to get off them. But obviously, if there are significant risks, and if their chance VAS score is low, I do discontinue anticoagulation. Um, so uh, to, um, and there's an anecdotally, we know that even with a chance VAS score of zero, especially in people who have chronic and persistent atrial fibrillation, their risk is not um, infinitesimally low. We have, a, I had a, a mutual friend who's a cardiologist in England. He has a chance VAS score of zero. He was due to have his ablation and uh, he was in a movie watching a, a movie with his son's um, daughter in the theater, and uh, he developed a, a middle cerebral artery stroke, and the daughter was able to rush him 
to the hospital and he got thrombolytic. Now obviously his, his chat score is not zero and he's on anticoagulants. So, so uh, even with a, a low score, uh, their risk of stroke is there. Uh, but then you've got to balance the benefit versus the bleeding risk. And the problem with um, you know, all our patients, and including us, we all hate Coumadin, it's a pain. Um, and, and if you look at the, interestingly, as the chat SWAS score goes up, the Coumadin usage is, uh, actually uh, comes down a little bit. That's because probably they are more, have too many other comorbidities, they're not able to tolerate the anticoagulation. So it peaks at around four, chat score of four or five, the Coumadin uh, usage, again, is only about 50%. Um, more, nearly 50% of patients uh, on, uh, with atrial fibrillation who should be on anticoagulation are not. And the reason being, there is a problematic drug, so you have a high bleeding risk, uh, it, you got to take it every day, you got to remember to take it every day. There's a high non-adherence rates related to food and drug interaction issues and they, it needs to be monitored regularly and even if you have, um, um, if you monitor it, uh, it, it tends to be capricious um, and it complicates surgical procedures. So uh, uh, we are all looking for alternatives and, um, and we did find alternatives for the last seven or eight years. We have the first one on the horizon, we call them the NOVAX, the novel, uh, novel oral anticoagulants. Uh, the first one was uh, Dabigatran or Prodaxa. Then we have a slew of them now. We have uh, Eliquis and Duralto and Cerveza, and there are probably some few of the other, other ones on the horizon. But uh, they also have a bleeding risk because that's what they're meant to do. They're supposed to be anticoagulants, so they do have a bleeding risk. Uh, and what is not mentioned in the slide is the cost factor. Um, most of our patients, uh, they, they, they come, we sp uh, give them samples, they, we give them coupons, but if you follow them after some time, at two years, th only 30%, uh, I mean, nearly 30% of the patients stop taking these drugs. And I think cost is a major factor here. So, and again, so, and they do have significant bleeding problems. My own experience is that the Rivaroxaban, that is Zeralto, tends to have a slightly higher bleeding risk, but they're all probably comparable in terms of their bleeding risk. The joke is that if you want to uh, try them to get some of the non-pharmacological agent uh, therapies, then put them on Zeralto. <laughs> So, so we were looking for options, and I think uh, uh, at least since the late 90s, we've been looking at options, non-pharmacological options for management of the stroke risk for atrial fibrillation. Um, the first one trial, I think, I don't know, Fred uh, may be too old to remember, but that came in the late 90s, uh, it was called the PLATO trial, which was a negative trial, which was a trial uh, to look at uh, having a device to occlude the left atrial appendage. So the market got more robust in the, since the early 2000s, and there's a small company in Minneapolis called Atrotech, which came up with a device called a Watchman device, and it was indicated to reduce the risk of thromboembolism from the left atrial appendage in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And now, why do we focus on the left atrial appendage? 90% of the um, thrombi which come in atrial fibrillation is from the left atrial appendage. Sometimes you can get it over the septum or in the, in the left atrium as such, but most of the action is in the left atrial appendage. That's why we as um, you know, uh, interventional cardiologists and surgeons, we focus on the uh, left atrial appendage. So, um, I mean, there are several trials. I'm not going to spend too much on the trials. There'll be some future slides about the trials. But most of them, uh, the patients are patients who are at, uh, have a higher risk, that the CHAT score of two or more, and they have been recommended for long-term anticoagulation therapy. And uh, when the trial was first designed, uh, we wanted to see whether it is um, um, comparable to Coumadin. So for the part of the study, the design was that they need to be on Coumadin at least for about uh, six weeks, for 45 days after the implantation of the device. So they need to be able to tolerate uh, anticoagulants for a um, um, short period of time. 
and they have an appropriate, and uh, this is what the FDA came up with, that they need to have an appropriate rationale to seek a non-pharmacological alternative to Coumadin. Uh, taking into account the safety and effectiveness of the de device compared to warfarin. Now, the FDA approved this device in 2015, and there's a, a reason why they came up with this wording, because uh, most of the trials were done not for people who could not tolerate anticoagulants. It was designed as an alternative to um, uh, warfarin or other anticoagulants. Uh, and partly is designed by market forces because you're looking at a much bigger market. If the trial was designed as uh, people who are intolerant of anticoagulants, I think probably the FDA would have approved much earlier because the patient population is much smaller. But the, 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 purposely the uh, study was designed as, as an alternative to Coumadin, not as in per, per people who could not tolerate um, Coumadin. So uh, the FDA approved it in 2015, and CMS, uh, as usual, takes its time. Uh, about a year later, CMS approved it, uh, but uh, their uh, criteria was slightly different. So you needed to have a CHAT score more than two or a CHAT's VAS score of more than three. So even though the FDA approved it for a CHAT's VAS score of two, the CMS will pay for it only if there's a CHAT's VAS score of more than three. Uh, they must be uh, suitable for short-term warfarin, as the FDA demanded. And uh, there should be a shared decision-making between a patient and an independent, non-interventional physician. Of course, I'm not biased, right? So I put these devices, I'm not biased. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, what they want is a non-interventional uh, uh, physician to be part of the decision-making. So at SMH, we have a watchman committee. We meet uh, once a month. Uh, we, uh, but that actually is, does not constitute part of the shared decision making that we just want to screen these patients and it is appropriate, I think, to make sure that they are the ideal candidates for these devices. After they are screened by, these, um, um, by this watchman committee, we get them to see a neurologist um, and, or any other non-interventional um, cardiologist to make sure that they are the appropriate candidates for this device. And then they are, it's a part of a national registry. All these patients have to be submitted to a um, uh, left atrial appendage registry. Uh, operator requirements, it could be an interventional cardiologist or electrophysiologist. In uh, our hospital, initially we had three electrophysiologists who were trained, and now we have an, another interventional cardiologist um, who is trained as well. So you may see that number grow. And uh, the criteria for um, um, this is they should have at least performed 25 transeptal punctures. And primarily, there's nothing uh, electrophysiological about this procedure. So it is a purely uh, um, um, you know, an interventional procedure. The reason electrophysiologists are involved in it, first, we muck around the left atrium almost every day of our lives. And, uh, and most uh, electrophysiologists who do uh, ablations or complex ablations are proficient in transeptal punctures because we do it almost every day of our life. So that's the reason we are involved, and probably also we see a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation as, as such. But this, there's no uh, electrophysiological principle we use, so to speak, uh, in uh, doing this, performing this procedure. Uh, the facility requirements, it should have a structural heart disease like a TAVA program. Uh, and or, or an electrophysiology program. So the device I tell my patients, it looks like a jellyfish. Uh, it's, uh, it's got uh, this, uh, this material is made of micron, is my, and then this is facing the left atrium, and it has all these spokes. That's called a nitinol frame. It latches on to the muscle, and we call that the pectinin muscles of the left atrial appendage, and it keeps it in place. So there are different sizes. Uh, our left atrium is, comes in, left atrial appendage comes in different sizes and forms. Uh, so they have, uh, uh, we, we have five dias, uh, sizes for uh, currently with this device. It's a 21 millimeter, a 24 millimeter, 27, 30, and 33 millimeter. So if it's your, if you are too small, if the left atrial appendage is too small or too big, then we cannot uh, uh, deploy these devices. There are other devices which may fit, and we'll talk a little bit about it later. 
But then uh, if they're not ideal candidates, we defer to the surgeons because I think they have a tool up their alley as well. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. So the design is that it should uh, avoid contact with the left atrial wall. So this, this area here should not be in touch with the left atrial wall to help prevent complications. Uh, we talked about the nitinol frame, uh, and, and this is the uh, 160 micron membrane which is designed to block emb emboli and promote healing. Now, about the Coumadin, which is what all our patients are uh, curious about, some of them are not able to take Coumadin at all, and there are some trials ongoing where we put them on uh, just dual antiplatelet therapy, but typically we try to put them on Coumadin for 45 days. So 92% of them are on at uh, 45 days, and after 12 months, we can stop it. I mean, after 45 days, we stop it, and 99% of them are off it at 12 months. The reason with this disparity is that sometimes uh, when we do a follow-up transesophageal echocardiogram after 45 days, sometimes you may see little Goomba on top of these devices. If you do see that, then they need to continue the anticoagulation. Um, and uh, it is, uh, I would say it is a relatively, uh, you know, uh, flat learning curve. Uh, it's, as I said, for us, it's a relatively uh, slam dunk type of procedure for, for an electrophysiologist who spends l doing long procedures. We look forward to the day when we're able to do a watchman. That means I, my procedures will be more like my interventional colleagues, like Dr. Etteraldi. <laughs> so uh, we can do quick, short uh, procedures. So uh, this is how we access, uh, um, gain access to the left heel appendage. Uh, we use uh, different sheets to get there. Again, uh, it is a transfemoral approach. We go through the femoral, preferably the right femoral vein because the transeptal puncture is much easier from the right femoral vein. And uh, we exchange that to this sheet, which is designed to get into the left atrial appendage. So most often we use uh, this uh, curve, it's called the double curve, but sometimes you have a, a single curve and an anterior curve depending on the anatomy of the appendage and the morphology of the appendage. So there are, um, there are four different uh, morphology. One is called the chicken wing, and chicken wing is where a little hook comes up like this. For that, you may have to use an anterior sheet uh, then there's a windsock, which is what we like, which is a relatively easy one. Then there's a broccoli and a cactus, and those are the different terminologies for the, these type of um, uh, structures. So, uh, so the uh, procedure is performed, uh, even though it's a short procedure, we do it under general anesthesia, and we do it under constant transverse of uh, geoechocardiographic monitoring. So the T helps in monitoring the patient and also helps in making sure the device is deployed properly. Um, so, and usually we keep them overnight. Medicare con considers this as an inpatient procedure. They want you to, uh, even if the patient may be able to be discharged the same day, they are considered as an inpatient procedure. But we tend to keep them overnight. So, uh, is this going to play? It's supposed to play. Uh, so that's uh, the left atrial appendage, and this patient is in sinus rhythm, so you can see the left atrial appendage is squeezing well. And uh, this is after we deploy the device, and you can see that uh, that space is completely uh, occluded. So here, we want to make sure that this, uh, this area is covered and there's no leak, there's no space here, and we will look at, assess that by color and also with, with the dye. So this is the fluoroscopic arosine run of the image. Um, so you can see that the dye is filling the appendage through the uh, device, so and you can see the uh, flow outside the appendage into, we call that the mitral uh, washout. So that's a good deployment, and this is how it should look. This is a 3D image of the same thing. Um, so you can see the, you're looking at it from the atrial surface, 
and this is how the appendage, uh, the, the, um, the watchman device will look uh, from within the left atrium. So after we deploy the device, we want to make sure it stays in place. So we want to make sure the device is distal to the or at the ostium of the left atrial appendage. Make sure the uh, anchors are engaged and the device is stable. So we do a tuck test. We pull on the device before we actually release the device. We pull on the device and make sure it stays in place. And uh, we want to make sure that it is the right size because uh, if, if it's the right size, it should be compressed. That will ensure that the device will stay in place. And uh, there's a proper seal and make sure all the lobes of the left atrial appendage are covered. Sometimes there's an area, a problem um, which the surgeons, when they put the left atrial clip, also they'll find a space between what we call as the ridge and the left atrial appendage. And that area of the left atrial appendage is smooth. So if you leave that, leave that area, uh, the studies have shown it is not prothrombotic. So, and we see that both with the left atrial clip, which is what the surgeons do, and with the, all the different types of left atrial occluders, we find that area is not really prothrombotic. So if you see that, then when you see the dye, and if you have a good placement of the device, we just leave it alone. So uh, this is how uh, on the echo these uh, devices should look like. So it should be covering the ostium. This is a different images to show what the, where the device should be. So it, if it comes up here, then it is too proximal. Then the device is not stable. There's a good chance it will pop out. And uh, there was a risk of embolization in the first trials. Um, and we had to go and retrieve it from the descending aorta. But that uh, percentage was about 5 to 7 percent in the initial trials. That has become less than 2 percent now. So this is how we tug on the device. A, it has, the device has a little knob. So we pull on this knob and look at the fluoroscopy to make sure that, the, that once you pull on it, that it goes back into the appendage. So, uh, and then we look for the compression. And uh, these are the different sizes of the device we mentioned. And, uh, uh, usually it's a cardiac anesthesiologist who does the TE and he measures uh, across this area. So this is called a threadbare insert and this is, these are the shoulders of the device. So we go across from the shoulder from one end to the other and for each device it has a specified compression parameter. So you want to have at least uh, about roughly say 10%, 10 percent, I mean what they say is 8 to 20 percent. So you need to have at least around 10 percent of compression. Uh, I always I mean, oversize it because my feeling is you can never be totally overcome and compressed, which is not necessarily true. But uh, the re my argument is that if you put a you know, bigger device, the compression will be higher. But if I err on the other side, if it is a smaller device, then the risk of embolization is higher, and then if it is not adequate, then we have to uh, change the device. So I tend to go with if the, what we call as the depth. If the depth allows me, I try to go with the higher device if feasible. And uh, then we look for the seal. Uh, we want to make sure that there's no flow. And that will happens even when the surgeons put their clip. Sometimes you can get leaks. And uh, the leaks can be problematic. And if uh, we say uh, a leak of uh, less than 5 millimeters is acceptable, but that has to be, I mean, when we look at these devices longitudinally, and some of these leaks have expanded. When you come back about a year later and do a T, sometimes these leaks have become bigger. Sometimes the leaks close off. So it's hard to predict how the uh, body uh, endothelializes. So, uh, um, and in the surgical literature also, interesting in surgical literature, they found that leaks of two to five millimeters are problematic. They can, because then you can get a little pouch here, and that can cause a uh, little thrombi, which can be um, a higher, uh, cause a higher risk for stroke. So this is a, a canine model, and uh, this is what uh, the device would look at 30 days, and in 45 days, 
it tends to be a smoother. And that's the rationale for using this 45 day uh, for anticoagulation. We believe that's about the time it takes to endothelialize. So this is a patient who had the device explanted after nine months uh, uh, in a postmortem study. Apparently had a non-device uh, related death and this is what the device would look like. Now, uh, the, we have a lot of data on this uh, device. This is the most studied uh, um, device, I would think, apart from uh, compared to valves and uh, you know, towers, all the other devices um, out there, uh, even compared to many of the uh, defibrillator trials, this is the most studied trial. Uh, it's been around for almost uh, 15 years, uh, um, the initial um, 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 the device. And at least the initial studies were started, the uh, PROTECT AF trial was started in 2005. So, um, so obviously, you know, we as cardiologists and electrophysiologists, we had to provide data to get any approval. So the surgeons don't need that. They came up with a left atrial clip and a year later it got approved. So we had, we had to go through several FDA uh, and uh, it, I think it went through three FDA um, uh, committees before it uh, finally got its approval. Uh, so uh, there are five, five studies, it's, uh, uh, about 2,500 patients, which is actually a good number for any kind of device study. Uh, so it is, it is a safe alternative to long-term warfarin therapy and it uh, has comparable stroke reduction and it enables patients to stop taking uh, warfarin. It has a 95% implant success rate and this is what we already alluded to, but more than 99% of them will be off uh, Coumadin after one year. And the procedural success is, uh, you know, when you look at the initial trials, uh, even, the, uh, even when the operators were new, it is upwards of 90%. And this is a uh, post-FDA approval, which is quite impressive, and 70% of them are new operators. And you have at least a 95% uh, success rate with, even with new operators. Now, the safety profile, this is the first trial, and obviously the complication rate was high, and most of it was related, some of it was related to device embolization, but most of it was related to a cardiac tamponade, uh, and that number had come down, so it is about 2.8% now. And these are the complications, uh, pericardial tamponade, procedure-related stroke, device embolization, and, and death. So you can see in the PROTECT AF trial, which is the first trial around 2005, compared to the uh, post-FDA approved um, uh, um, era, you have, still have about 1% of um, a cardiac tamponade, and uh, the procedure-related death, I think it's about 0.06%. So this uh, tells you about the safety profile, and this is, goes through all the different trials. And the aggregate uh, total um, pericardial tamponade is about 1.28%. And, uh, and, and a substantial amount of them, we do not need to do any intervention. Uh, Procedure-related stroke, 0.18%, and device embolization is significantly less than when it was with the PROTECT AF trial, it's about 0.25%. So uh, mortality, procedural aid mortality is 0.06% and additional mortality within the seven days was 0.07%. So this kind of is a meta-analysis showing um, its benefit as opposed to uh, Coumadin. So this side, this side means that uh, it, it is better for Coumadin, this side means it's better for Watchman. So where, uh, if uh, well, ischemic strokes, Coumadin is slightly better for ischemic strokes. But whether it is hemorrhagic uh, stroke or, or cardiovascular death or any unexplained death, all-cause mortality, major bleeding, all that favors Watchman. So this tells you about what the expected uh, you know, uh, ischemic stroke is. So this is a patient, uh, this, is, this um, line shows people who have not um, been on anticoagulants and this shows where they have been uh, treated with anticoagulants. 
So watchmen, even with all the different trials, they mirror where the line should be when they are treated with anticoagulation. And uh, the other one thing is that, and this slide is important, because uh, the, the, all the trials were done for patients where they were um, com comparing um, the device versus Coumadin. But that's not reality. I, I would say about almost 90% of all the patients who are referred to me are patients who cannot take Coumadin. They're not on any anticoagulants when I see them in the office. So there it is a no-brainer. These are the people who are not uh, on anticoagulants. These are the stroke rates. And see how, how much of the uh, risk reduction you have with the device. So if, nobody, if they are not being protected with any kind of anticoagulant, you know, the decision to implant the device in my mind is a no-brainer if they have the right anatomy. Um, now there will be a time when people will come and say, I, I don't want to be on anticoagulants. Can I have the device? And we'll all have to contend with that at some point. Uh, so these are the observed rates of major bleeding over time. Uh, over time, so in the post-procedure therapy, uh, that is uh, soon after the device uh, implantation, we put them in Coumadin and aspirin, and then uh, aspirin and Plavix alone for six months, and this is the destination, this is where we want them to be, just on aspirin alone. And uh, you find that uh, with once they are in that phase, in the destination therapy, the bleeding rate is 3% as opposed to uh, being on Coumadin is uh, nearly 10%. And this is where most of your benefit will come. These are the bleeding outcomes after left atrial appendage closure compared with long-term Coumadin. So this is the freedom from, um, of major bleeding. And you see that Coumadin drops off. So there's, there's a 72% six months post-procedure. There's a decrease in the freedom from major bleeding. So uh, some of our patients are frustrated because they thought they could come off the Coumadin and they are referred to me and they said, I tell them you need to be on Coumadin for 45 days and some of them are not happy even for that short period of time. So uh, there is an ASAP trial, that ASAP meaning aspirin and Plavix, uh, which, yeah, which was uh, published in 2009, but they had only about 300 patients. And it was a positive trial, but it was not powered to give any recommendations to um, uh, patients. So now there's an ongoing trial, it's called ASAP2, uh, and they are um, in enrolling about 900 patients. And uh, it's already enrolled in last year, and there's a five-year follow-up. There are 100 sites globally, so you're looking, the arms are, one is Watchmen, and three months of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, followed by nine months of low-dose aspirin. And the other one is the control group is uh, single um, antiplatelet on no therapy, and the randomization is two to one. So we are waiting the results of these trial, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, what I do in my practice is, some of them, um, after we've given them the device, uh, they've had a, a, a gas GI bleed or they've had a cerebral bleed, then obviously they're going to be off the anticoagulant, then I don't put them back on it. Um, and some patients, uh, they cannot go through the surgical procedure. There are some contraindications. This is their only option. Uh, we have, uh, because in Mount Sinai, they have a, a fair amount of patients who may have, they've just done that just uh, left them on aspirin and Plavix um, post-implantation of uh, the Watchmen. So uh, people who are not, I said there are five sizes, and um, uh, some of them it may be too small or too big, or the morphology is such that we cannot uh, implant these devices. So that's why we need to screen them with a transesophageal echo, and we get measurements, and we also get a, a, a CAT scan, a CT angiogram of the left atrium. Despite all that, we find that these are not candidates, then obviously we have to get the help of the surgeons. So then the, uh, the surgeons, uh, what the current, they had an iteration of all different devices for the last 20 years, but I think they finally hit the jackpot with this left atrial clip. And I think it is a great device, um, and it does its job. I'll let the surgeons talk about it, more about it if they need to. But uh, I think they uh, predominantly, if there's a concomitant uh, valve surgery, they do it. 
and I think all of them should have it. In terms of uh, when they're having any type of cardiac surgery, should they have the left atrial clip? There's debate amongst the surgeons. Um, as an electrophysiologist, if they, uh, if they ask me, I will tell them, please go ahead and put the clip. If at all they ha get an atrial fibrillation later on, it, it makes my job easier when I do the ablation. I don't have to worry about the left atrial appendage. But uh, the reason why some surgeons pass is because uh, the left atrial appendage apparently has some neurohormonal properties and um, people believe that it is there for some reason. You should not be taking it for everybody. But on the other hand, we have the data from Cox Mace for more than 25 years and we know that people can survive without the left atrial appendage. So, uh, you know, definitely when they have any kind of, um, you know, uh, valvular surgery, I think most of our surgeons, they take it off. In terms of uh, coronary disease, when they have bypass, whether they take it off, I think it's variable, I guess. The practice is variable. Then we had this lariat, which I used to do, but I was in Tampa, I did a fair amount of them. And, uh, and, some, and actually, when I moved down here, I think I did a couple of them. But I moved away from that, partly because I knew the, uh, 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 the watchman was coming, and partly is because the left atrial clip such a, does such a great job, and I feel that in good conscience I cannot do this lariat procedure. Lariat, by the way, is uh, where we do uh, put a noose around this um, left atrial appendage, but is uh, done both uh, uh, transfemorally and with a, yeah, I need to use a pericardial approach. I have to make a pericardial stick and put this little purse string around the left atrial appendage. I believe it is a morbid procedure and I don't think it is any less morbid than the surgeon putting a lariat through a thoracoscope. Uh, and I think they do a much better job because they can actually see the appendage when they do that. Whereas with a lariat, I'm using my best guess most of the time. So I kind of uh, moved away from that. But there are some institutions which still do lariat procedure and there is some data showing that doing the lariat along with a catheter ablation may help uh, decrease the atrial fibrillation burden, but um, most of us electrophysiologists and have moved away from the lariat. Um, so this is, uh, um, bef the, uh, there are a lot of other devices um, coming, and uh, the, there are, I've done some off-label devices before Watchman came, uh, and this is a person who had, you can see he's got um, uh, a by, prior bypass obviously was not a candidate for lariat at that time and the patient was too sick to have uh, uh, any kind of uh, thoracotomy and obviously with this again I don't think the surgeon will be able to deploy the left uh, clip with a prior uh, bypass surgery they will have he will need a thoracotomy I don't know if you can correct me if I'm wrong but most likely it will be difficult to deploy this uh, clip through a thoracoscope with a prior cardiac surgery so uh, in them, uh, I ended up putting this device. It is actually used to close uh, holes in the septum. There's an ASD closure device. It's an Amplatza device. So you can see I've, uh, this is my sheath. And I've, 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 just like the watchman, I've deployed this device. Now, this device is in the market now, and is it is given a different name. The same company which used to make this for the ASD closure, they call it the Amulet, which is again owned by Abbott or St. Jude. Um, and they, uh, it is on trial right now, but, but because Watchmen was approved already, they have to compare it with Watchmen. So we believe this trial will be done by 2020. And I think this has some aspects uh, which uh, looks interesting. And uh, because here it has got two discs, so I'm not too much concerned how much depth there is here. Whereas with Watchmen, I want to make sure that there's enough room for me to do that. So in some of the um, uh, anatomies which are not suitable for Watchmen, this might be an, another option. So uh, this um, you know, uh, field is going to continue to grow. I just uh, put the uh, three ones which are currently on ID trials in, in the US. Uh, this is Amplatza one. This is a Johnson & Johnson, the same company we use for doing ablations. Uh, they bought a, uh, another um, a small company from the US. It's called Coherus Wave Crest, and it's already available in Europe. And uh, it's an ultra seal, and there are about seven devices which are available in Europe, which people, they can use. 
So this field is going to continue to expand, I think, and I, and I think in our own experience here in this hospital, our watchman, Malim, I'm not sure whether David may, has, has gone up right over the last year, and it will continue to grow. And there are more implanters, so you will see this field continue to grow. And uh, that's it from me.